Well, hello everyone and welcome out to Maverick Trading's Currency Midweek for May 11th, 2022. Corey here with you. Uh, always nice to be with you. Actually, let me just do a backup recording here. Let me make sure that we have that just in case. So uh, welcome everyone to the Maverick Currency's Midweek and let's get to it. As always, just a quick reminder to make sure that you follow your trading plan. So plenty to talk to in regards to the markets. We have a lot of volatility. We have a lot of, you know, asset price movement, crypto. There's a lot to discuss. So, you know, plenty of, of things to talk about. Markets are still in a downtrend overall. This is stocks. Um, we could say that about bonds. We could certainly say that about crypto. We could say that about most markets. I, I guess the only one that kind of comes to mind right off the bat that's having a good year is energy, oil, and some of those things. We've gone from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening, and that takes time. I mean, think about how long quantitative easing and money printing went on for many, many years. So QT, look, we got to remove excess. And, you know, I not to offend anyone, but I kind of ripped on things um, for a number of months now, just talking about NFTs, you know, non-fungible tokens and how people were paying millions of dollars to own this, the rights to Jack Dorsey's first tweet when any anybody can go and take a picture of that. You know, what, what do you have rights to and why would you pay millions? And it was just ridiculous. And, and it's the sign of excess and it's the sign of bubbles and it's the sign of people losing their minds and not thinking about intrinsic value. What can this do for me? And it was the ultimate kind of get rich quick or, you know, try to, you know, it's the greater fool theory. It's basically, well, it doesn't need to be worth anything as long as some idiot comes in behind me and pays more for it than I did, right? So it's the greater fool. I'm gonna buy it, I'm a fool, but I believe there will be an even greater fool. And that's just not a way to buy things, uh, it goes without saying. Now, I'm not saying that everything uh, in these spaces is, is wrong or bad, but there was a lot of excess and a lot of risk-taking that was just wild and, and the wild, wild west, and there's gonna be prices to pay, you know, and, and ramifications for that. And I'd say where that was really true is really in technology, um, you know, all the new things for Bitcoin. So the story of this week is Tether and the undoing of, of Tether. Basically, you know, when you when you mark when you, you know, mark a price to something else, it creates huge ramifications. They kind of thought, well, we could create this stable coin and link it to the US dollar and it will be pegged to that. And whenever you hear the word pegged, as an FX trader, the hair on the back of your neck should stand up and you say, that is a dirty word, you know, pegged to something. Why do we say that? Well, you probably know the history of the pegging of the Swiss franc, right? And at Maverick, and by the way, our traders didn't get hurt. I think there was one trader that was trading the Swiss franc, um, but they were doing that <laughs> against our better judgment because we've always said at Maverick, you don't trade pegged. You don't trade pegged assets because when that peg is removed or something goes wrong, all hell breaks loose. You, you know, this is something that central banks tried in decades past, and I can't think of one success, but I can tell you a bunch of failures. In fact, you know, George Soros became famous because he broke the Bank of England and so on. Well, the pegging to something else's value, the idea that you can just make this peg to that one's value, it just doesn't work. And so, you know, Bitcoin and these things tethered and pegged to US dollars, it was a disaster waiting to happen. Well, What's happening with those stable coins that are supposed to trade at one in value, you know, equal to one US dollar, they're collapsing and there's a sort of run on the bank that's happening. And the value is collapsing and, you know, I think it's hit as low as 30 cents and maybe it's lower, I don't know, but it was as low as 30 cents. So, you know, every dollar you got in, you can get out about 30 cents of it now, and it might get worse before it gets better. And I don't suspect 
it's ever going back to a dollar. Too many people want their money back. And it's just, you know, they had it pegged. And then there were supposedly these ways that you were going to make these huge interest rates and not have any risk. Again, you've got to think about it from the standpoint of there's no such thing as huge reward and zero risk. I, I wish there was. I wish people would just walk around and, you know, hand out money for no no reason or whatnot. Now, only the government will do that, right? From a trading standpoint, there it's just not possible. So anyway, there's there's a lot of things happening on the crypto side. Obviously, uh, a few weeks back when we said crypto is trying to break out and it failed, this is one of my favorite trading strategies. It's counterintuitive, but I trade failed breakouts. And we mentioned this at the time that, look, if it's failing there, you got to get short, you got to get bearish, whatever you do, you don't trade it to the upside. From false moves come fast moves, and that's certainly played out in that market. So look at things that have failed breakouts, failed you know, upside, downside type of moves is where there's oftentimes a lot of opportunity. On the economic side, it's all about inflation. That That is, and I, I don't even know this to be true, but I'm just going to guess in terms of financial terms, inflation is probably one of the highest Google searches in 2022. Um, people Google search whatever, you know, the catchphrase is. And right now that seems to be inflation. So my guess is, is that there's a lot of Googling about inflation. Well, what's interesting about this? We had CPI and core CPI a little higher than the expected numbers, which markets kind of frowned upon a bit. Um, I do think there actually is an argument. This is going to surprise you probably, but I do think we probably are at peak inflation. What do I mean by that? Well, inflation here at like eight and a half, nine-ish percent, I actually do think it's backing up. I probably mentioned this last week. I think we're headed towards, you know, seven and six. I think we've seen the peak in it for now, but that doesn't necessarily help the markets because it's still, if we go back to 6% inflation, you're still three times larger than the Fed's target inflation rate at 2%. One of their main mandates is to keep price con, you know, under control, price stability as they call it. Uh, at 8.5% inflation, that is not stable prices. Now, the reason that we're probably going to back up a little bit, actually the market downturns and some of those things happening in the markets actually help this to kind of get a calming of inflation. I do suspect that we're going to kind of back up a little bit, but the Fed's going to be hawkish in 2022. Talk to me later in the year, and I think we can start having the discussion of, you know, towards the end of summer or something about inflation coming back, about the Fed not hiking as much as the market anticipated. I think the market's going crazy with these, oh, a 75 basis points coming next, and then a 50, and then another. I think the market may be Again, they might be overdoing it, but um, that's a discussion for a few months from now. For now, the Fed has to be hawkish. They're behind, and inflation is you know, a really big problem for markets, and that's what they're battling. So in a weird way, they're kind of cheering on a lot of this excess being taken out of the market. It was a, you know, at least a sign of some of these things. When you just print money, look, money's going to do some dumb things, chasing performance and so on, because it's just not, you know, you can't print your way to prosperity. There needs to be value whenever there's a transaction. There needs to be fair value in exchange, you know, work for pay, um, you know, asset for for this capital or whatnot. And when people are just making stuff up and then millions and millions of dollars are going into it, billions in some cases, and it's not real, it's, it's just kind of all part of that same kind of fake approach. So as we look at this week, I mean, it's an absolute bloodbath over here in crypto land. We'll touch on that. On the FX side, 
You know, Aussie and Kiwi struggling, the CADs hanging in there as the only commodity currency hanging in. I thought that Aussie might be able to do okay. Kiwi's been a problem, but I thought Aussie might have a little bit of a turnaround, and that's not been the case. So we're kind of in this mode where it's risk off, and that, that risk off sentiment is winning. As you look at the S&P 500 chart, we broke support and we broke support heavy. You could have a bounce back, certainly, but the path of least resistance is still lower. And it does concern me how many people think that they're kind of calling a bottom. Hey, we've hit the lows, you know, too much fear. I, I don't see it personally. I think we've got a little bit of a trap door here where my guess is that the next phase of this downturn is forced margin liquidations and some really ugly kind of finishing moves. So my best guess is, is that the day we're finally at the bottom, it's going to feel absolutely horrific. It's going to be, you know, maybe the market will be down four or five, six percent on the day. You know, it, it could be really, really bad um, where people are throwing in the towel. That's the tendency that's kind of how these things oftentimes work is that they're twisting the arms right now and they're twisting the arms and they're applying the pain and you'll be shocked the same way that markets can shock and surprise you at how far they go on the upside. Well, it can be even more than that on the downside. And that's kind of the phase we're in is they're just applying pain and the max pain is still to the downside. and as long as people are willing to sell and it kind of keeps feeding off of itself, it's going to go and it's probably not going to finish until there's a big flurry of that. So the yen, yen is really, I'm going to call it sideways for the past few weeks. And I, I feel good about kind of calling that it had such a big downturn to start. I think moving away from it as a candidate was probably the right call. Um, there's been better things lately. Obviously, U.S. dollar has been the best of the best, but CAD's been good. Pound has been great on the downside. That's been an area of focus. Uh, so, you know, in terms of FX, we're going to look at some of those pairs together. Uh, crypto, it's just, I don't know what to say. They're all in way past double digit sell offs. Um, the more speculative you are, the more deterioration you've seen and you know this is for the week they're down 30 percent 25 percent tether coming apart i mean it it really takes a hit to the whole thesis of cryptocurrencies now i'm not saying they're not going to exist um that they're going away or whatever but it really hurts some of the things that have been kind of incorporated and believed in and so forth. Now, the belief as far as crypto being an asset, again, that's not going away overnight. But we're in that spell of big mass deterioration. And for these assets, it would feel like 30% down in one week should be the end of it. I'm not so sure that's the case. They just deal in a higher level of volatility than other risk assets. So a 30% down week can kind of be a breakdown of sorts, no doubt, but it might get a lot worse before it gets better in that, that area of the markets, I fear. So if we're grading this market, you know, I think you've got to go, whoops, you got to go minus three to minus two, you know, somewhere in that realm. Um, you know, I, I would say we're already down 3%. So I'm kind of looking at this as for the rest of the week, maybe down another leg similar to what we've been. But it's hard to, to short things when they've already broke, well, equities specifically, when it's already down 3% on the week. It's hard to keep shorting it, but I still think that's the trade. Oftentimes in trading, you can ask yourself, what's the hardest thing to do? And the hardest thing to do here is probably still to stay short, to add bearish trades and so on. And, you know, if I have to do something, I'm going to I'm going to really deeply consider shorting versus buying into this market. Uh, no question. Uh, you know, 
every time in this type of chart environment and so on, you just stay short or or add to it if you've got to do something else. So we had inverse cup and handles that we had highlighted. It traded perfectly last week. We highlighted that, hey, these should bounce on the Fed meeting, but ultimately that should be the failure. Go back to the S&P chart. I should go back one. We highlighted this exact chart pattern. I mean, it's just picture perfect. So same exact dynamic. I'll draw it onto this chart. We talked about that on the Fed meeting, you should probably see a bounce, but that bounce would be short-lived and ultimately see the inverse cup and handle. Now it went just a, a touch. We kind of measured it out to 425-ish. It, it, it kind of shot up to 429 or whatever it finished at there. But basically, that handles about 30% of the size of the cup. It failed right where it should, and now we're in the other side of that. We've broken out of that pattern, and you want a really dire expectation. I don't know if it's going to get this bad, but you could really say, you know, 462 is the, the size of this cup to 412. That's 50 points. You break here and you go 50 points to the downside. That takes you to like 362 or something. Uh, considerably lower. Another 10 plus percent to the downside. And I think that's more likely than not. Um, you know, we've been pessimistic. I came into 2022 about as pessimistic as, as one can get in terms of broader markets and where we might go. Uh, nothing that's happened this year has changed that. And in fact, I mean, if you're saying anything's happened, it's only added to that bearish thesis, really. As you look at crypto, you know, a couple of failures, a couple of different key levels, but you can kind of see the same type of, of consequences. When you hit a level of support, sometimes you bounce big and then you come back and it's like the bouncing ball. And then when it rolls off the table, all hell breaks loose, right? There's no, there's no knowing where the bottom is here. Uh, the bottom could be considerably lower. In the case of crypto, you know, again, I think this type of huge measured move is probably exactly what's happening and transpiring. And, um, it should really, you know, experience that. That's what that's what happens when you have too much froth and it comes off. Um, it's it's not that these were necessarily every crypto coin is is bad or going to end up worthless or whatnot. But again, they were just inventing new crypto coins every day. You know, every day there were new ones being invented and people would pour money into them. And and I'm going, does does anybody else? think that this doesn't make sense you know what what's the logic here and it, it all went to greater fool it was hey i'll buy these and someone will buy them from me later for more than what i paid so what do i care well the problem is is as they call it the bag holders and whoever got stuck holding them is left holding the bag and experiencing all the losses and maybe that those people that you know, ex are experiencing all those losses, didn't consider the fact that this was even possible, that values could change this dramatically, that there can be this much volatility. And I always tell people, look, in financial assets, the volatility will shock and amaze you. Even the, some of the biggest, most widely known things have crazy amounts of volatility. Think about it. Take Netflix. Okay, Netflix is a multi-billion dollar corporation. You know, they win Oscars. They've been around for a couple of decades. Okay, they're big. They're huge. Guess what? The 52-week high, just in one year, the stock price has been as high as 700 and been as low as like 130 or 40 or whatever per share. Think about that in context. Think about how much volatility that is. Imagine this was a house that you lived in, that you owned, and it fluctuated in one calendar year between 700,000 in value and 130. I mean, how how shocking would that be? Oh, my house is worth, you know, 200,000. Oh, it's worth 700,000. Oh, it's worth 130,000. In one year, just in 52 weeks. And that's one of the biggest corporations out there. 
Um, so when you're looking at this in context of volatility, can something that has literally only been around for a couple of years and some of these were recently just kind of made up and so on, are they going to experience more volatility even than Netflix, which has revenues and earnings and all, you know, customers paying? These are coins that have no earnings, no revenues, no, you know, nothing to kind of backstop it. This does, and it has this much volatility. So believe you me, you know, there's a lot of volatility into, I mean, it's not done yet. Now there will be to that same token, I guess I should say, it will shock and surprise you how big the rallies can be. Where are the biggest rallies? They're in down markets. So when you think about, if you look at history and you say, what were the 10 biggest up days and the 10 biggest down days? All of them are in bear markets. You don't get massive up and down moves in a bull market, right? Bull markets kind of climb as they say, the wall of worry or stairs up. When you go into a bear market, all hell breaks loose and the, you'll have the biggest up days and the biggest down days all within a bear market. So last week, when we saw that volatility around the Fed, that's just bear market trading. That's all that is, okay? It's not uncommon to see 3% up, 4 or 5% down. That's actually pretty standard. I mean, I wouldn't say standard, but it's it's pretty normal of a bearish market environment. And we're in a, a global bear market scenario. The rest of this week, there's really not much. Tomorrow you get PPI, producer price index. So another little inflation gauge. Let's look at some charts together and kind of make sense of things. So uh, if anyone has anything they want to look at, fire away. I'm happy to, to take a look at those names together. Uh, let me pull this up. And we'll take a look at a few of these charts and just kind of, you know, again, go through them one by one. So maybe I'll back up one step. Let's go USD. So what's key about USD? Well, we highlighted it last week and we actually traded, I hope, I hope people did okay. We traded the US dollar against the British pound last week. And here's that long-term chart. Let's go back a long ways. Let me kind of back this up a little bit. Here's the chart that we highlighted and the trade and, and so forth. So last week we kind of talked about, hey, this is back up. This is the US dollar, the Dixie, the dollar index back up to this multi-year high. This was the peak in 2017 and 2020, and now we're back up there again. We traded this Fed meeting last week, and it was wild. Well, every asset was wild. But at one point, we put on a trade that had like 28, something like that, pips of risk, 20-something. It wasn't a lot. Pips of risk. The reward potential on it actually was quite high. Um, you know, in fact, we could have made substantially more than that, but it went 70. So it, it was like a three to one winner at one point. So I hope, you know, worst case, somebody at least moved their stop loss up if they were trading it, broke even, locked in some profits, took half off, whatever you did, should have been a good trade. I mean, it moved three times your risk in reward in your favor. So you certainly had opportunity. But what was crazy is the, the Fed said, you know, Powell, the chairman, basically said some magic words, which were kind of to the effect of we're taking 30, you know, 75 basis points off the table and the markets reversed violently, but it only reversed for one day. So that was enough to swing that trade from you know, 75 pips of profit to stopping you out um, just in a hurry, just in a flash like that. But hopefully you did okay on that. Certainly was working up to that point. But here's the key level for US dollar. Now, we certainly could have a big downdraft in the USD that's only kind of a hammer like candle. Um, or not hammer-like candle, uh, handle-like pattern in the cup and handle. 
The only thing I would say about this that makes me a little less skeptical is, you know, take this peak off and it's a perfect scenario for a cup and handle. But you don't usually get cup and handles where you're at the triple top. You know, in a way, this is kind of not picturesque for a cup and handle. It's kind of a triple top should start to break out, you know, whatever. Um, but we'll see. I don't have a super, super strong opinion about where this has to go or anything that way. But that's where U.S. dollars at big picture. So if we look at the daily, you know, like we said, it had some whipsaws last week, but ultimately has pushed higher here over the past few days. CAD looks really interesting to me because you're still high basing. We know how strong energy is. We know that commodities are one of the better pockets of strength. And it's all relative, right? But that should be relatively good for the Canadian economy as compared to some of the others. That should be theoretically better for Canadian dollars versus other currencies. So, you know, that's a, a little bit of an area to pay attention to from that standpoint. If we look at yen again, Yen has been, you know, really strong since kind of the flush out. And this was a few weeks back. You had the big flush to the downside. We bounced. We made another little leg lower. And since that time, I'm going to call it sideways, but we're actually higher. From that exhaustion low, we're actually up overall in value in the yen. So uh, kind of stopping trading yen to the downside, I think that was kind of your big flush out period. And so there's just been better areas to look at. Swiss franc, still a downward bias here in Swiss francs. Uh, this was the one that was famous for the peg removal and the huge volatility. Now it's no longer pegged, but the trend is lower. Euro, you know, trying to battle it back. You can see relative to other currencies, you got to give euro its its credit where credit's due. Look at what the euro's doing. Whoops, I didn't draw that where I wanted it. Let me try that again. There you go. So resistance, resistance, resistance. And now we've kind of pushed through and now giving a little check back. Euro looks like it wants to trade higher and it's got good characteristics. Look at the upward sloping 20. Look at the 2050 crossover. I think euro has its day in the sun. I, I'm I'm bullish euro. I am. Now the velocity is not there yet, but I think that's going to happen sooner rather than later. I actually really think that euro could go. Uh, looks pretty good. Pound has been a disaster. We've talked about that one more to the downside. I don't see anything there that changes that. Aussie couldn't hold and is kind of you know, sideways and choppy, and then Kiwi's just been in a downtrend. So if you want to short something in that growth, you know, commodity FX space, I think Kiwi's the one that continues to be. We talked about it the past few weeks. If you want to short, if you want to play the risk off in currencies, Kiwi's a good short. Um, Pound has been a good short. Those would be the two that are obvious to me. And Swiss franc, I guess, also, but pound and, and kiwi have kind of been my my preferred uh, bearish currency trades. On the bullish side, I'd still stick with CAD um, and euro. You know, I I haven't had a, a euro long or a euro short in the past couple of weeks, but I like it here. I think euro could be a good candidate to look at. So let's come in to a few of these requests. We had a request for Kiwi USD. Here's the daily chart, obvious downward trend. Come into the four hour, still downward trending and kind of low basing. Come into the one hour, you know, you can see the chop, but still overall a little bit more downward trend. Um, let me say, it makes sense. I've got no problem with it. If you want to trade Kiwi USD to the downside, fine. But I might prefer, you know, Euro's a little bit fresher and it's not against its huge resistance and so on. So let me change 
the idea just a bit to say that Euro Kiwi actually has more strength recently, recently broke out of a base, new uptrend emerging, and so on. I I like Euro Kiwi to the upside. Um, I don't have any qualms against trying to trade Kiwi USD, but I think it's a little bit more dangerous in that, again, US dollars up against that massive resistance on a multi-year basis, multi you know, decade basis in some cases. And and so it's a little bit more difficult right here, right now. I liked it on the Fed meeting because we kind of spotted an opportunity, but I, I'm not trading U.S. dollar one way or the other right now, just knowing where it's at. I don't know, you know, my thought would be that, like we talked about last week, that you kind of get that blow off move that kind of false move up above, and then we spend a few weeks going down in U.S. dollar. And I haven't seen that big flurry of a finish. So shorting Kiwi USD and then looking for that big flurry finish, okay, you know, I, I'm not against it, but I, I would actually turn my attention more towards something like Euro Kiwi, um, which Brandon asked about. And so there you go. Well, now you you kind of get where my mind is at there, Brandon, perfectly uh, stated. So let's look at it on a little bit different time frame. The daily, good. The four hour, what is this pattern? Well, we call that, see how it's kind of got that downward phase to it. So here is your flag pattern. It's kind of that bull flag type of dynamic. You've got the pole and you've got the flag and should turn up and out from there. That's on the four hour time frame. And then we come into the one hour and you can see the choppiness, but I suspect it should go and start to elevate, should push through here. So I think you've got to wait to be a buyer until it breaks the flag pattern towards the upside. But at that point, I think it's ready to go. Um, all right. So. Yeah, on the short side, I mean, I I don't know why I would get away from pound necessarily. So if you want to look at something on the short side, you know, I think you could continue to look at. We talked about uh, pound against the CAD as an example. So if you've been trading pound CAD, we just had a pullback. See it bounce for a couple of days and is currently rolling over. So that's a bear rally short setup. That's on the daily. Take that chart and go to the four hour and you can see where it's rolling over, just starting to break down again. And what should happen is that moving average kind of slopes down as this thing works its way lower. So something like a you know pound CAD on the short side can make sense. One hour chart, support broken. You might get a little bounce here in the short term, which which frankly might be the entry point. But uh, any way you slice it, those would be the charts. So as I'm like, you know, grading these out, um, as we just say, kind of bull, bear, neutral, you know, anything I don't have a strong opinion on. But on the bullish side, continues to be more of like the CAD on the upside. And then the euro is a relatively new addition to the more bullish side of things. On the bearish side, it continues to be pound, which looks and acts a little weaker. It continues to be Kiwi, which just is one of the weaker currencies out there. You know, that to me is more of your obvious bull and bear list. USD, I think you could kind of say, you know, the best case scenario, for a clear signal in USD would be for that thing to burst sharply higher. And I w personally wouldn't really trust it, but uh, you know that would be kind of the finishing touches to what's been a great run. If you get a big kind of flurry finish, you can play USD to the upside during that in the very short term. You gotta be quick, you gotta be ready to, to take action, to pull off the trade, to do what you need to do, but you know, following that advance, it probably sinks back in and and probably experiences kind of like yen, where it goes sideways a lot and then kind of back and feels and so on. Um, and then, 
trends can start all over again, but things need a little bit of a breather. The US dollar's been on a heck of a run, probably needs a little bit of a rest and consolidation before it can go again. So those are some of the things that I'm I'm seeing out there. Um, hope this has been helpful for you. You know, if you have any questions, any comments, anything that we can help you with, don't ever hesitate to ask. Have a great rest of your week, and we will see you next week. Same time, same place. Goodbye, everyone.